Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Sherman, and I am an assistant curator here at the Whitney Museum. It is my great pleasure and distinct honor to introduce Dawood Bey and Rebecca Walker for their conversation tonight. We are thrilled to be able to host these two on the occasion of the New York book launch of Dawood Bey, Seeing Deeply, the gorgeous and comprehensive new book published by the University of Texas Press. It is always an honor to host two incredible thinkers and artists who are also old friends and to be privy to their ongoing dialogue. Dawood Bey is an artist working in photography and video. Beginning in 1975 with his project Harlem USA, his portraits and his street photography have created an unparalleled historical representation of various communities in the United States. During a residency in 1992 at the Addison Gallery of American Art at Phillips Andover, Dawood embarked on what would become an ongoing series of portraits of high school students. He made his artistic practice more public and accessible, involving the students in shaping their own representations and working in a semi-public studio. His most recent project, Night Coming Tenderly, Black, depicts real and imagined sites on the Underground Railroad through which fugitive slaves moved from Cleveland and Hudson, Ohio to Lake Erie and on to freedom. Dawood received a MacArthur Fellowship in 2017 and is currently a professor of photography at Columbia College, Chicago. Long associated with the Whitney Museum, he is well represented in our collection and we very much look forward to presenting a survey of his work along with the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in 2020. Rebecca Walker, oh not pu <laughs> Rebecca Walker contributes to the global conversation about gender, identity, power, and the evolution of the human family through writing books, developing film and television projects, speaking internationally, collaborating with artists and thought leaders, teaching at the university level, and participating in all forms of social media. Her work has appeared in many anthologies and publications, including Seeing Deeply. In addition to the international bestseller, Black, White, and Jewish, her books include Baby Love, Choosing Motherhood After a Lifetime of Ambivalence, and a number of anthologies, including Black Cool, 1,000 Streams of Blackness, to be real, telling the truth and changing the face of feminism, and what makes a man, 22 writers imagine the future. So it is with great pleasure that we <laughs> introduce these two incredibly accomplished people. Um, after their conversation, Dawood and Rebecca will have some time for a brief Q&A. And following your questions, copies of Seeing Deeply will be for sale outside the theater where Dawood will be signing books. And now, please join me in welcoming Dawood Bay and Rebecca Walker. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We are as thrilled to see you as I hope you are to see us. <laughs> um, and we are, are just really looking forward to being in conversation with each other. We've known each other over 20 years. And, uh, 27 years. 27 years. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and it's really exciting to, to be able to bring some of the conversations that we've had in private um, over the years into this kind of environment where we can you know, share um, the way two artists really relate and think about the world with you and then hear what you think afterwards in the Q&A, right? I believe we are. And thank, thank all of you for coming out. And I uh, certainly thank everyone here at the uh, Whitney for giving us the uh, opportunity uh, to have this conversation. Yes. So we wanted to start uh, with the portrait of me that just flashed by. Did you all see it? Um, and just to, to, to talk about how that came to be, we met at Yale, and I got to Yale because I, you know, I, I was in a very sort of progressive alternative community in San Francisco and ended up at Yale, which was very conservative and was sort of shocked by the difference. Um, and Daoud, you got yeah, there I, on a very different I, journey. I went what was to, that? Uh, well, we met in 1991. Uh, 
I, I was in the uh, MFA photography program, uh, yeah, from 1991 to 1993. And uh, we met uh, in a class uh, that was taught by a great professor, uh, Sylvia Arden Boone. And it was a class called Mask and Masquerade. Mm -hmm. uh, I had considerable background within that tradition. Uh, I was a drummer before I was a photographer. Uh, I've actually played for Masquerade. Uh, so to have the opportunity to uh, consider that in an academic context with someone like Sylvia Arden Boone uh, is what brought me to the class. Right. And, and since that's why where we met, I'm kind of wondering what brought you to that class? I mean, what were you? <sighs> what brought me to that class? Well, I, was, I, want, I wanted to talk about what brought both of us to Yale, to Yale. Yeah, as an institution. Um, because you were coming out of really working in the community and had decided to move over into the academic space. And, you know, I think we both, I was drawn to Yale because I, I identified it as a place of power in a certain way, institutional power. And I knew that I wanted to be able to utilize that power wherever I was going to go. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, and, and also because obviously uh, Robert Ferris Thompson was there, Sylvia was there, Vincent Scully was there, who I was also very drawn to, an amazing art historian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was this blend of being drawn by the creative and also the understanding of the need, uh, specifically as a woman of color, to have as much power as possible, to be able to um, amass you know, the resources that I might need moving out into the world. And Neil, obviously, gave me some of that, right? Did you have similar well, thoughts? Well, I, I came from a, a, a background of having been a part of an active community of both artists and photographers in New York, going back to the mid-70s. Mm. Uh, uh, those communities centered primarily uh, for me, around the Studio Museum in Harlem, the early iteration of Studio Museum in Harlem, which was a place uh, where a number of us found each other. Mm. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, inspired by the appearance of the Black Photographers Annual in 1975, I think, uh, I began to seek out some of the photographers uh, in that publication who were in New York, uh, who became my early friends and because they were older friends and mentors. Uh, people like Bruford Smith, Sean Walker, uh, Anthony Barboza. Uh, and that community in New York uh, at that time certainly uh, centered very much around uh, Roy DeCarava and his work. So that was my initial community. And I'd been working as a photographer, uh, exhibiting. Uh, I had gotten a number of fellowships. Uh, I had the beginnings of a very uh, active career. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting is that at the moment that I began, the professionalization mm -hmm. of the art world in the academic sense. The BFA and the MFA industry hadn't quite kicked in yet. Mm -hmm. So that was not a point of reference. Mm -hmm. uh, I started off earlier, although I didn't stay. I was an undergrad uh, at the School of Visual Arts. Mm -hmm. I stayed for two years and left to uh, work on my first project, Harlem, USA. But uh, I'm almost 100% certain that none of my professors there had an MFA. Right. Uh, that was just not a part of the conversation right. uh, at that moment. And then I began to uh, think about it because there became another moment um, when different friends of mine, artist friends who were a part uh, of my community, uh, 
Carrie Mae Reams is probably the first one to suggest to me, you might want to think about grad school, though. You might want to think about this MFA thing. And of course, I was in the midst of making my work, so right. I didn't think I had time to think about this MFA thing. Right. But um, one by one, uh, a number of friends, uh, Carrie Mae Reams, Lorna Simpson, Albert Chong, Louise Stern, folks started to disappear uh, and they went off to grad school. Right. Uh, and they came back and they told me that it was something that I might want to think about. Part of it too was, without going too deep into this conversation, it was also the moment when a certain amount of uh, philanthropic and foundation support right. emerged in order to make possible MFA mm -hmm. for uh, artists of color. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually the uh, Minority MFA Fellowship mm -hmm. that was originally administered by uh, the Ford Foundation mm -hmm. and then was uh, taken over by Philip Morris. So when I went to Yale, I went on the MFA uh, Minority uh, Fellowship. I had been exhibiting quite a bit. I was even in my first semester at Yale in an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. Right, I remember that. Somehow. Yeah, because I was a part of that the, community. Right. I'm, I'm from New York. I was part of that community. So and people told you to do it, but what, what really made you do it? To t what, you know, did you? Uh, it was probably one of the only things that I hadn't done. Mm -hmm. And I looked at some of the things that uh, artists that I knew who were doing things at a certain level, what they had done. And one of the things that I began to notice was the appearance of this MFA. Mm -hmm. uh, In terms of stability and sustainability uh, as, as yeah. artists? or Yeah, and I, I knew that William craft. T. Williams had gone to Yale. I knew William T. Williams had an MFA. Right. I knew Howard Dina Pendell had an MFA. Right. I knew Martin Perrier had an MFA. And I held their work in very high regard. Uh -huh. And I also knew that they had an MFA from Yale. Right. And I had several friends who had gone to Yale and done their MFA there. Uh, so finally, I think uh, Carrie Mae might have mentioned it to me for the third time. And, uh, and did you feel that? Did you <laughs> and I knew I didn't want to go to California. Right. I, I knew I, I did not. I did not. I, I was not at right. that time uh, a theory queen, and I'm not a theory queen, queen now. now. Right. I, I didn't want to work in a way that was theory based. I wanted right. to work in a way that was object driven. Right. That you make the work, and the conversation comes out of the work. Right. And. Uh, that's what the photography program at Yale was known for. Yes. So that's why I decided to go. Great. And, and you stayed because of the engagement of the people you were working with, and you felt that your craft was really developing there and being Yeah, nurtured. the rigor of people rigor. that I knew, like uh, Abe Morrell, yes. Michael Spano. Uh, there were a number Benson. of photographers that I knew who came there? out of that. Was mm -hmm. Lois Connor there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the one thing they all had in common was that they worked in a way that was very rigorous. Yes. They made a lot of work, uh, and that was something that I was fundamentally committed to. This belief that one thinks by making things, that the making things is actually the thinking made visible. Mm. And the more things you make within a critical context, that's what will get the work to where it needs to be. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it was all about that. It was all about the making of the object, a very rigorous, critical conversation around object making. And how did your work develop then? Uh, what, what changed through the program? I mean, if you were making more work in this rigorous context, did you notice your aesthetic changing or your sensibility? What, what, was, what happened? Well, it, it's interesting because uh, it was a moment when the dominant conversation in photography uh, as a fine art form anyway, was moving away from this idea of small camera street photography uh -huh. to a more deliberate kind of picture making with a large format camera. Uh, that was the fundamental shift. Uh, I remember the day in the photography department when boxes of four by five cameras showed up and we were told you're going to learn how to use these. Wow. 
Like that was the shift. Uh -huh. You know, the small camera conversation, Gabby Rennegrand and that whole history. Right. We were in a different moment. And fortunately for me, I already had a four by five camera. <laughs> I had already made that decision. Right. So I felt in some ways that my work was uh, already aligned with that. But at the same time, because I had been making photographs in the street for so long, I wanted to uh, pretty much on my own, wanted to push my work in a different, less conservative direction. And that's what led me to the Polaroid studio and the right. 20 by 24 Polaroid camera. Right. So let's talk about that, um, because that's where we did the portrait. Uh, it was an incredible experience to be photographed by Dawood with, in front of this gigantic Polaroid. How big was that? It was yeah, it's a 265-pound <laughs> camera on wheels. Yeah. It's, a large, it's a large view camera. That's yeah. basically what it is. Uh, it has to be used with an assistant because it's too large. It's, it's too deep. It's about six, six and a half feet deep. So when you stand behind it looking on the ground glass, you can't reach that far to focus it. Wow. So there's a technician that you literally have to work and think through. Right. In terms of a little more, a little less, stop there. Uh, so it was a very different experience, but it wasn't radically different because it was just an oversized view camera. Right. The images upside down, I was used to that. Right. Uh, but what, what initially inspired that work goes back to the sixth grade. I, I had to write a, a book report or a report, and I chose to write about Rembrandt. Mm. Uh, and somehow I fell in love with Rembrandt's paintings. Mm. Uh, that heightened sense of both the physical and the psychological uh, isolated subject within that warm, that warm brown space, mm. a single light source. Uh, and so when I started uh, making my first photographs in the 20 by 24 studio, mm. Rembrandt and a certain kind of historical painting mm. was my point of reference. And I just wanted to take those devices and apply it to a contemporary subject, my yeah. subject. Yes. Uh, starting initially with my immediate friends and community. Yes. Well, I didn't know about the Rembrandt connection and that um, really speaks to this idea of seeing deeply, which is the name of the book, and also I think really um, describes your, your process and your approach and your vision very well. I feel that you see very deeply. <laughs> um, and I felt seen very deeply in that portrait. You know, I think you saw something in me that I hadn't seen in myself. Um, and I just wonder about how you came to see so deeply and we talked a little bit about um, your, your loss of hearing, you know, and how that may have affected your, your looking. Uh, I, I, I think it certainly has something to do with it mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the science of that is that for any sense that one loses, one overcompensates mm -hmm. with other sensory perception. And, uh, my hearing loss uh, resulted in, I, I just think I see more than most people. I kind of know I do, because I have to. Right. Yeah, because I have to. Do you uh, remember the moment when you first had that experience of seeing deeply? Well, that, that's interesting, because there were some pictures that flashed by in the beginning, uh, four square snapshots. Uh, and those were photographs that I made of my grade school classmates uh, when I was 10 or 11 years old. Mm. Uh, and I vaguely remember the experience. And uh, it had to have been unusual to take the camera to school and then during lunchtime say, Eddie, stand over there. <laughs> Tyrone, Where did you get that camera? Because yeah. they're, yeah. they're very deliberate. Posed photographs. Yes. They're not spontaneous. They're, there's a very straight line between that work and a lot of the work that I uh, went on to do. Uh, what provoked that? I don't know. But I do know that I do my seeing and my thinking through the camera. Uh -huh. You know, because the camera functions in ways that are fundamentally different 
from the way we see the world with our eyes. So I've never made the kinds of photographs that are based on replicating something that I see, mm -hmm. because I understand it through the lens, mm -hmm. through the material, through the light, through the whole process of making photographs, the, the uh, potential to create something that is more of a, uh, it's the transformation of the world into a photograph, mm -hmm. a two-dimensional, optical, materially-based object. Mm -hmm. And I do my thinking looking through the camera. I will know what I want to, you know, what the nominal subject is and what the conceptual and the narrative framework is. But I don't really begin to see it in the deeper sense. Right until I'm looking through the camera. Right. That, that's when I start to visualize this thing that I am attempting to make, to translate that into this kind of object uh -huh. by manipulating the lens, by using a certain uh, material, mm -hmm. photographing under certain lighting conditions and not others. All, all of those things add up to a very particular kind of object. And I'm always aware that when I'm making photographs that they're going to be a certain kind of object. Right, right. I know what the scale is going to be. I know, and my work lives inside of the space of museums and galleries. Right. So I know the space in which I'm trying to provoke a certain conversation. Right. So I, I have all of that. I just need to look through the camera. That's begin to shut out the rest of the world right. and just deal with that rectangular space, uh -huh. which is the space that I have to work in. Uh huh. It's a lot like writing. A lot of people say that they write to understand the world around them. You know, they don't really know what they're seeing until they run it through the filter of the writing process. So that I really relate to that. But does that mean that you find your truest self represented in the photographs? That 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 the that the object that you create is really the manifestation of who you are. If that is if, if that is how you you are thinking, do you feel that way? I, I, I mean, I would say so. Uh -huh. It's uh, it's probably probably the way most of the people in this room know me. Yeah, that's uh, that that's the thing that I do. That's how I make my thinking visible, visible. in the world. Uh, but do so. you feel then that you um, that you why do you feel you need to do that? Do you feel is there safety in that? Is there power in that? What is your motivation for? I, I think there are things the that don't exist in the world, and I make them in order to bring them into the world. Right. You know, because yes. I'm I'm always conscious of making work. Uh, with a high degree of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. They're about the things, the people, the issues, the history that I care about. And I'm aware that I haven't seen anything quite like that. And the only way to see it is that I have to make it. Yes. I have to bring that into the world. So part of the motivation uh, for the work is to bring in the world the things that I need to see mm -hmm. with the understanding that if it's important enough to me, it will probably have meaning to someone else yes. as well. Yes, and, and we've talked about how you make work thinking about where it's going to live, that it's gonna live in the gallery, it's gonna live in the museum, it's gonna live in a space of contemplation for people. Um, so how do you imagine or um, how do you hope, how do you intend the work to change the consciousness of the people who experience it? Well, I think, uh, well, it's, it's an interesting question because I do consider the work that I do to be transformative work. And it doesn't work in the literal sense unless the person who engages the work walks away with a different set of ideas, a different way of thinking, a different way of thinking about the world than they did before they engaged the work. The idea is to make the work People come to a museum, they come to a gallery with a certain set of expectations about the kinds of things that are shown in those spaces, things that should be looked at. The right. culture determines that there are things that have value that should be looked at. 
So I want to situate my work in the space of the conversation about things in the culture that should be looked at. And then to talk about the things that I think need to be talked about, but to make them at the same level of execution yes. as those other objects yes. in the museum. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is always uh, an important thing to me because I'm, I'm driven by the need to make an object of a certain quality and I'm also driven by the need to have that object speak to and about very specific things. Like in, in these photographs that happen to be up now, about the way that the physical and the social landscape of Harlem is being transformed. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that. I need to talk about that because Harlem is the beginning of my own personal narrative. Mm -hmm. My mother and father met in Harlem. I did my first project in Harlem. And Harlem is a place that's always going to resonate with me mm. for that reason. Uh, so I need to make work about that. I need to make work about what that looks like, what that feels like. How can one make that fact resonate in such a way <clears throat> that when somebody goes back into that environment, they will notice things that they might not have noticed except for having seen the photograph. Oh, that's what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I intend for the work to some, in some large or small way, have this kind of uh, transformative effect on the viewer. And the larger, the larger agenda of my work is yes. to enact that kind of transformation one person at a time with the hopes that as more and more people see the work and leave the work with a different level of criticality, a different level of awareness about the world, people who occupy the world, who might be people who are not like them, but who become more humanized through my work and through which they're able to have a momentary experience of someone that they might not have had that same kind of experience with out in the world. Yes. Having been alerted to that in the photograph, mm -hmm. my hope is that they take that back out into the world mm -hmm. and that they engage with the world in a way that's different from the way they engage with the world before their encounter with my work. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I have any agenda, that's my agenda. That's a good agenda. I like that agenda. <laughs> um, can you talk about some of the photographers who influenced you? You know, when, when you were starting to make those pictures as a young person, who were you looking at, you know, and were you... Um... Well, it's an interesting conversation because the work is a conversation with history also. Yes. It's a conversation with, uh, with those who have made photographs. Uh, and I, I think about that a lot because uh, basically what I want to do is for my work to have something to add to that conversation. Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like history is this table and it's full of people who have sat there and done significant things. And then you come along and there's an empty seat there. Mm. And you have to sit in that seat. <laughs> but you got to have something to say. Exactly. No pressure. And it <laughs> helps to not say something that is completely out of sync with what's being said. Yes. You know, it, yes. has, to, it has to share a language, even if it doesn't share an intention. See? Yes. But it has to be couched in a language that allows you access to that conversation. Mm -hmm. So for me, the work that I do, when I first started looking at photographs, the first exhibition that I went to see on my own uh, was a small show of photographs by Mike Disfarmer. Mm at the Museum of Modern Art, probably 1977. And for those of you who don't know, this farmer was a town photographer in Herbert Springs, Arkansas, uh, making photographs of people who came to uh, his studio to mm. be photographed. Uh, ordinary people, special occasion, we need a photograph. We go to Mr. This farmer. Pretty much the way that people in Harlem went to Mr. Van Der Zee. Right. So same thing, there's a neighborhood Same photographer. Case, uh, or, right. And so you go. Right. And uh, so I looked at this farmer. I went to see the Avedon show. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to see Urban Penn's Small Trade. Uh, some of you might know the Small Trade work, in which he took working people in their workaday guys and brought them into the context of the studio. Mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of profound, mm -hmm. that you didn't have to look at folks, you know, everyday folks 
in the context. You could actually isolate them in the context of the uh, studio. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at all of this work, and I was looking at a lot of things that weren't that kind of work, and I just began to notice what resonated for me. Mm -hmm. And this idea, this rather simple idea, that a person standing or sitting in front of the camera and engaging the camera could result in something very deeply meaningful mm -hmm was what gave me the confidence to you know, begin my, my own work photographing in Harlem, making mm -hmm. photographs of uh, everyday people. But also uh, within the shape of a conversation with uh, Roy de Carava. Yes. Because unlike, say, Gordon Parks, uh, de Carava was making that work for entirely subjective reasons. It wasn't on assignment, it wasn't for publication. He was an artist. Yes. And that work was going to exist on the wall or on the pages of a book, but a book that was going to be about his work. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was an artist. Mm -hmm. um, that's why uh, Roy became uh, my first model, my first uh, hero. This idea that one could make subjectively intentional photographs mm -hmm. of ordinary black subjects that were clearly a conversation with both the subjects and the medium itself. Mm. Roy, Roy de Carabo was uh, hugely uh, important. Yeah, I learned about his work through you. <laughs> I learned about so many artists through you. Um, so eventually you began to work within a community of artists like Carrie Mae Weems and Jules Allen, Frank Stewart. Um, what has the conversation with them been like from, from the beginning of working together to now? You know, in, in terms of being an artist, of being a black artist, working within the context, the socio-political context of then and now. Um, well, I think more than anything, it's been uh, the kind of nurturing and reassuring that we get from each other's presence, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that we're each committed to this thing that we are doing and knowing that we have, with each other, uh, been deeply committed to that before anyone knew or cared what any, what any of us were doing. Right. So we were very foundational uh, support to each other. And in terms of sharing work, sharing ideas, uh, that, that's the foundation of uh, who I am, really. I, I come out of that community. And, you and know, was part, there Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Was there an articulated intentionality around the black subject? Around, I mean, I know this is obvious, but I want. I'm interested. <laughs> I in, would say absolutely. I know, obviously, <laughs> but I, I, I'm interested. Absolutely, in, that's right, who so you, we were. Right. It was. It was. Revel, it was. It well, was that's who aesthetic. we were, and we had right. to add something to the conversation about the medium, and we also had to do that in a way that foregrounded the experience that was ours. Right. Not that there's any monolithic, the black experience, right. but this idea of the histories of the ways in which the black subject has or has not been represented right. historically within the medium mm -hmm. of photography because of uh, De Carava's uh, clear articulation of that being at the center of the work we, we each just took that to heart. Right. But we had to find our own particular voices and strategies and ways of engaging that. Uh -huh. But this notion that we were responsible for and accountable to a history was absolutely the thing that bound us. And do you think that is true today in the same way? I mean, do you think, and in terms of you know, what's happening with African-American artists right now. I mean, this is, you know, it's an incredible I, time. Things are... Well, I know, I, I know between me and Carrie Mae it is. Right. Uh, between my generation it is. Yeah. Uh, if you're asking me about younger artists, uh, I'm not sure because I, uh, I make a very real effort to keep up with, uh, with what, art, what black artists of a younger generation are doing. And I ask them that question. Right. And... Uh, what they tell me is, it's different, Tyreek. Oh. It's different. And uh, one of the reasons it might be different uh, was at the time that uh, Carrie May and I and Jules and Frank and a number of other and photographers Lorna, of right. that, 
there, there was no market for the work. There was no, no one was interested. We were each other's market of ideas for the work. Uh, that's changed. There is a market for that work. And I think for younger artists, there's a certain expectation uh, for things to happen professionally that we didn't have, certainly at that level. Mm -hmm. You tried to get fellowships, you tried to get grants, you tried to sell some pictures to the Museum of Modern Art, which is kind of like you know the epitome of a successful moment. You right. tried to get your work on the walls so that people could see it and engage with the work. But the idea of selling work and sustaining oneself through the sales of the work, that was probably as far as a purple tiger. Right, right. I mean, it was, it was just, it wasn't an idea. But I think it is the end result of the professionalization of the field that began when we went to grad school. To MFAs, right. Yeah, early right. on. Right. And now there's a whole history of younger black artists who've come out of all of those programs, Yale, RISD, uh, any number of them. And along with that, uh, there is a certain expectation that may or may not be realized. And what that creates, I think, is a different level of competitiveness. Mm. And sometimes that, can, that, that competitiveness can you know, intrude on relationships. Mm. Mm. So the community is, is much different. Yeah. And do you think that those artists have the same kind, do they feel obligated to have the same kind of relationship with the history? Do you feel, when you look at their work? I would like to think they're not working in a historical vacuum. Vacuum, right, I know, uh, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, would like to, I, I would like to think, but uh, I'm not sure. Yes. You know, if there's any of them here, maybe they can speak to it. But I'm, I'm not sure, because right. I don't know how to work in a historical vacuum. Yes. I would hope that they have the same respect for the history, and also the history in a more, perhaps, uh, dimensional and complex way, mm -hmm. a more global sense of the history. Because mm -hmm. I still remember the, uh, the small joke that I got when, instead of uh, referencing uh, the history of photography as we knew it here, uh, and I'm momentarily blanking on his name, uh, I encountered Helmut Gernsheim's history of photography. Hmm. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, that's the history of American photography. Hmm. There's a whole other history. Hmm. So I do think that one of the things that younger artists have more access to now is that global sense of the history. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm, I'm probably not the best one to speak for them. Okay, right. We're talking to you about your work right now. So let's get back to that. <laughs> um, so let's go back to, to when we met at Yale and, and, and the early 90s and, and your work with Jock Reynolds, who brought you to uh -huh. Philip Sandover to, um, for a residency and, and, as you've said, changed your practice forever. Yeah, radically so. Yeah. Uh, and it was interesting because, because I already had the beginnings of a career uh, when I started grad school. Uh, when I went to grad school, I don't know, some, some people I think thought I was teaching at Yale. Yeah. yeah. Which, which would have made more sense yeah. than... <laughs> yeah, I did in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it would have made more sense than yeah. temporarily interrupting a career to go back to grad school. Yes. So there were some things that continued to happen. And one of those things, <laughs> it, it was so interesting. One of those things was that while I was at grad school, I was invited to do a residency at the Addison Gallery of American Art at Philip Andover. Now, how does one do this? Be a full-time MFA student while still maintaining some professional practice. And I knew about that residency program. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who don't know, the Addison Gallery of American Art has a, uh, an artist in residence program that began, I think, 1934 or 35 with Charles Sheila. Wow. Most of those industrial landscapes from uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts that we know uh, of Sheila's work. He actually made that work when he was in residence at the Addison Gallery. Huh. So there's a long history of artists being in residence at the Addison Gallery, which is the museum, it's the teaching museum of Phillips Andover. 
which also puts artists in close contact with the students on that campus. And so in 1992, uh, I think it was uh, Jock Reynolds, who was at that time the director of the Addison Gallery of American Art, who had seen my work previously in a show that Rick Powell organized at the WPA when Jock was director of WPA. Uh, he invited me to do a residency there, an eight-week residency, mm -hmm. uh, to be on campus at Philip Andover. And I kept ignoring his phone call, <laughs> but because uh, I couldn't figure out how in the world was I going to do eight, an eight-week residency while I was a full-time grad student. So I refused to call him back. Uh, but for those of you who might know, Jock, he's very persistent. Uh, when he gets an idea, he does not let it go mm. until it is realized. And so I somehow connived to go <laughs> back and forth. I worked out my class schedule so that I could go back and forth to Andover over uh, eight weeks. Uh, one, one of my former grad school classmates is sitting down front here. You can, I, I, I came back to class very tired. <laughs> Uh, but what did Jock teach you? I mean, what, what was the turning point there in, in the well, work? Well, it changed the way I thought about institutions. Right. Uh, that an artist could work with and through an institution. That one could be invited to an institutional or museum setting, and that the museum could be an active partner mm -hmm. in helping you to, you know, to make your make work. Make your work, right. Uh, that was, for me, a radical and transformative idea because uh, pretty much all of the work that I have done uh, since 1992 has been done in, in conjunction with uh, some kind of uh, institutional collaboration or with the uh, support of the, of the institutional structure, primarily the museum. Mm -hmm. And it was Jock Reynolds who gave me a sense of how that might be both possible in that context and how I might take that elsewhere. Uh, ultimately, uh, the Addison Gallery of American Art, over many years, kind of became my laboratory. Uh -huh. That's where I did my thinking. Uh -huh. I did five different residencies there wow. over several years. One of them was a curatorial residency mm -hmm. where I went into their collection and curated a show. I did a residency there making the class pictures work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was an artist in residence there five times. I kind of had a standing invitation mm -hmm. uh, to come there and do whatever work I was in the midst of. But uh, because of that invitation, it gave me a very different sense of either what the museum was or what the museum could be. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the museum could, in fact, be something very different from this very closed, elite space that I thought uh, as the ways museums have functioned. So right. the other side of my practice had been an ongoing conversation with institutional culture. Right. Because all of this work, this one was made at the Paris Art Museum. I've set up studios in museums, you know, constructed programs with young people around the making of my work, mm -hmm. using the museum as a studio. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jock was really instrumental. This is uh, one residency uh, at the Addison Gallery. Took me into the classroom, using, using the classroom as a studio space. And then you see the photograph that comes out of that. Uh, Jock opened that whole space up for me in a really uh, profound way. So it was almost like you, you, the museum was, um, you were an outsider in some ways, and then suddenly you, you could see yourself in partnership. You were no longer. Well, yeah, I'm very, I'm, I'm absolutely comfortable in right. the museum. Museums are not only where I show my work, it's where I do my work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the place where I go to work and I make something, mm -hmm. whether it's an exhibition like you know, I'm working on with uh, Elizabeth, but it's the place where I go to do my work. Right, so you feel at home. Now, yeah, I feel very much at home within that's, our museum culture. That's very important. And it's, be and it's because of Jock. It's because of Jock. We love Jock. <laughs>
He was very supportive of my An work as well. Man. An extraordinary man. Extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary man. Yes. And you had your experience with him too, because I remember while I was there, he. Uh, I, I don't even remember exactly how it came about. He invited you to write. Yes. The uh, catalog essay for the Shacks exhibition. Yes, yes. I don't know if you'd ever written a museum catalog essay before. I had not, but I had done my, my senior uh, essay on, on what I was calling Shack Aesthetic, which was looking at how African culturalisms were um, encoded in African American shacks in the South. And he somehow found out about that work, got a, got a hold of my thesis, yeah, and asked me to I write a piece a some, I, for a show that he was and curating. And once he found out, he knew you had to be an essay. Yes. And he wasn't going to let go he until you agreed. Exactly. And and it was wonderful. I felt very supportive, and um, and very moved by his attention and his commitment to those artists in, in particular that we that he was showing. It was Beverly Buchanan, Kristen Berry. Um, yeah, Beverly Buchanan, Bill Christian Berry, and Max a Belcher. photographer from there. And Max Belcher. That's right, right. Yeah. Max Belcher. And they were yeah. all working, you know, looking at, at some of the same things that I was looking at, and, and it was a great opportunity for me, really, to think about writing about visual art, and, and it was the yeah. beginning of, of And several. I think it might also have to do with the fact that Jacques uh, was and is an artist who is also a very powerful museum director. Yeah. And I think the way those uh, two things, the artists and you know, understanding all of the protocols yeah. uh, of the museum culture, but also being an artist and uh, having a sense of how to both work inside of that structure and how to create a meaning for intervention or subversion into that structure yes. is something that, uh, yeah, he's been a very meaningful partner because when he went to Yale Art Gallery, uh, I did a residency uh, at Yale Art Gallery, did a project there. Yeah, uh, weren't we also. talking about curating something together with him at the Yale Art we, Gallery? We, we were talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, was a great re, idea. We need to renew that well, conversation. Yes, we he do. He had an idea for you and I to curate an exhibition. Yes, and can you imagine pulling from those archives? I mean, I know. We, right? We should do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move on um, and, and talk about the Strangers Community work, which I. Um, wrote about in the book. And, you know, it's very moving work. And, um, and it really asks the question of, you know, how can we build community in America, especially when we are so divided? Um, what is the project of making community? Are any of those images cycling through? Yeah, I think they were the ones before Before this. that, okay. Well, so. Um, but there's a pair of portraits of people sitting next to each other. Yeah, and, and really interrogating how we relate to one another. What does it mean to, to be together? Are we really, is it possible? That's my, yeah, my read. Because each of those people in the photographs are strangers, uh, but they live in the same community. Yeah. And part of the work for me was interrogating this notion uh, when people say, oh, we need to work, we need to do something in the community. Like who are you talking about? People talk about community in a very monolithic, essentialized kind of way when uh, communities are actually very complex, socially engineered structures, uh, which is why you can live in a community and not even know other people within that community. So I wanted to kind of uh, do an intervention into that and to bring people together from a community who didn't know each other and then have them sit together as a kind of form of uh, public witnessing mm. of their commonality as members of a particular community. So I made those photographs in uh, a number of different uh, cities. And uh, I asked you because I thought that you would be the person who could bring something to that work. Yeah that the work itself doesn't speak explicitly, but implies that you might be able to amplify what I think you did. Yes. Well, I've always been interested in that transgression, you know, between, you know, my parents were from different worlds and came together and, um, you know, thinking about dualism and non-dualism within a Buddhist practice, you know, what does it mean to be two? Are we ever able to be one? What is oneness? You know, mm -hmm. so all of those <laughs> things, I definitely thought about looking at those pictures. I wonder how did the subjects relate to each other? How did those people 
relate when you when you put them together? Did they find common ground, or did they just come, sit down, and then leave? Some some of them did, and it was very interesting because it also the coming together in some cases revealed a kind of social tension that had gone unspoken. Yes. Uh, I remember when I was working at Emory, at Emory University, and one of the subjects was an African-American man who was, I think he was the provost, uh, he was the college administrator, and the other person was uh, maintenance staff, and he was white. Uh, so the whole notion uh, that's embedded in that around privilege and whiteness. Uh, so when I brought them together, uh, the, the person who was the maintenance staff was quite nervous. He asked me, how do I address him? Mm. Do I call him Mr. Thompson? Or do I call him Provost Thompson? Uh, I said, you can just call him Bill. Right. I said, because that's what I'm going to call him. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. But uh, it kind of laid bare some of those social tensions uh, and allowed people to momentarily, and perhaps in an extended way, if they chose to, mm -hmm. uh, to continue that process of bridging uh, the social gap that that project was about. But for me, it was always a question mark. Mm -hmm. uh, and your essay amplified that question mark, particularly at this moment. Yes. This highly contentious, polarized, nasty moment that we're in, which seeks to divide more so than bring together. Yes. And to have that work written about in this context, I think, uh, really provoked a very uh, strong response uh, yes. on your part. It amplified what the work suggested. Yes, that, that it's possible we could not be together. We, could, we You know, what is community? Is it possible to, to actually, um, you know, get, get over, transcend, you know? Um, it's unclear, I think, at this moment in America. That's what we're all struggling with. That's what we're all, I think, many of us are afraid of, you know, that we might not be able to get through it. And then what, you know? And I think that work really asked that question. Yeah, and, and, and for me, you know, each, uh, each body of work in the book, mm -hmm. uh, I tried to very consciously uh, choose who I wanted to be the essayist mm -hmm. for that work mm -hmm. because one of the things that I'm acutely aware of working this way, you know, working within the constraints of the two-dimensional photographic object, photographs are inherently mute. Mm -hmm. There are things that they can't do. There are things that they can't say. They have very real limitations. We try to load them up with as much narrative content and meaning so that they begin to speak. But there's always a bigger world that lies outside of the frame of the photograph. Mm -hmm. And the photograph takes this piece and decides to talk about it as a way of emblematically speaking about all the things that lie mm -hmm. outside of the frame. But I was acutely aware in uh, putting the book together that I wanted each writer to bring their voice to the work in a way that amplified some of the things that the work suggests. Mm. Because all photographs can do is to make a very strong suggestion. Mm. At least the kind of work I make. I, don't, I, I do not make didactic finger pointing, you must do this and you must believe. Uh, I'm, I'm more a poet than an essayist. I, I don't believe in didacticism. Uh, so the book was an opportunity to, in some way, bring other voices to the work mm -hmm. to amplify the various ideas and narratives that the work suggests. Yeah. And, uh, I think it's successful. It's such a beautiful object. Let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, I'm concerned about time. How are we doing? I'm sorry? Okay, great. Um, I don't want to jump over the Birmingham project, though, so let's, let's not jump over it. Um, yeah, we're just having, we're just talking. We're just talking. I know we can talk and talk and talk. But um, so, so, 
so since we are on the book, let's stay on the book. So tell me a little bit more. Tell us a little bit more about why you decided now to create this incredible, um, comprehensive, dynamic, gorgeous book, you know? Well, the publisher approached me. He, uh, <laughs> that always helps. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, was, I was not looking. I, I make my work. And you like to think at some point somebody will notice and maybe that opportunity will present itself. But I've never been one of those. Let's put a book dummy together and shop it around. Right. Because I just have too much work to do to stop to do that. Uh, fortunately, this publisher, the University of uh, Texas Press, had done a previous book with one of the galleries that I work with, Stephen Data Gallery. Uh, in Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, he had uh, the head of the uh, University of Texas Press had an idea that he might want to do a book with me. Mm -hmm. So he got in touch with uh, Stephen Data, who's sitting right down front, and uh, asked Stephen to ask me, <laughs> do you think Dawood would be interested in doing a book with us? Uh, and of course I was interested without having any idea the amount of work it would take <laughs> to do a book that represents my life making photographs from 1975 until 2017, the Harlem Redux work. It was an extraordinary amount of work. That I, I, don't, I really don't even know how to describe it. Endless days of working to three, four, five o'clock in the morning, especially as deadline approaches. What was the hardest part? Was it about the selection of, of images since you um, had so well, many? Well, I think the hardest part was probably uh, the further back I went, mm -hmm. a lot of that work I hadn't looked at it or given it consideration mm -hmm. since it was made. Uh, I certainly didn't have image files of that work because at the time that that work was made, there were no Fuji image print. files. You know, there were no 300 DPI that ate back in, right. you know, JPEGs. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of that work hadn't been scanned. Uh, a lot of it I hadn't looked at since I made it in the 1980s. Uh, so it was suddenly... Uh, this huge task of going back into work that I hadn't thought about, in some cases for 35, 40 years, and having to look at it again, and look at it through the lens of the book that was going to be a kind of defining monograph for 40 years. Mm. Uh, and, and, and it must have been interesting to look back at it and to, and to see yourself back there, you know, at that time, that age, and to, to have to kind of reckon. I know when I look at writing that I've done 20 or 15 years ago, I, I'm, I'm often horrified. <laughs> you know, I think, wow, you know, this sentence is terrible. You know, what, what was I thinking? You know, and I, and I, it's, there's a mortification, you know, but there's also some pride, you know, and I, but I also relive where I was psycho-emotionally, you know, yeah. and that's not always easy. Did yeah. you feel some of yeah, that? Yeah, and there, back? there were photographs that I encountered, and given them that closer look, I could see the photographs that were really uh, formative, mm -hmm. you know, where right. I finally was able to do successfully the thing that I was attempting to do yes. that allowed me to go on and do the next thing after that. Uh, I became acutely aware of what those photographs were, mm -hmm. uh, those pictures where uh, I did something beyond what I was attempting to do, mm -hmm. where I saw, you know, to use that phrase, a little bit more deeply into both the subject and also the formal construct of the photograph, right. learning to take more chances right. and not to work entirely within uh, a certain kind of tradition. Right. You know, which is where I came from initially, you know, being a photographer from New York, uh, working with a small camera in the streets. Uh, there's this thing called the New York School. I mean, that's right. literally what it's called. Right. Pictures made with a small camera, black and white film, and you're out in the street looking for your piece of the significant aspect of the life of that, you know, situation. Right. 
and to be able to kind of uh, progressively transcend genres and types of photograph to be able to have the freedom and the facility mm -hmm. to make whatever kind of photograph I wanted to make in response to the idea or the narrative that I was trying to convey. Uh, I was able to see that more clearly in a way that I would not have wow. uh, had I not done the book. Because I'm always thinking about the next work. Right. I, I tend not to look back too much. Uh, right. Now you end up looking back when you, you know, you have to show the work and other people are showing that work, so you have to, you know, give it some consideration, mm -hmm. but not get trapped in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm never, you know, looking back. Right. This was a this was a deep look back. Yes. In a way that I hadn't, but also just the physical putting of it together. Uh, I had I had my team, you know, scanning and making match prints and, you know, putting out the call for these kinds of photographs. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't, you know, the back of the book is a chronology mm -hmm. and I wanted it to be an illustrated chronology mm -hmm. to visualize the community that I was a part of at different points in my uh, life. So tracking down those photographs, mm -hmm. uh, getting in touch with those photographers, it's uh, a lot. Yeah, it was a very daunting project. Yes, I yes. When I look Not at it, it's a daunting that... object. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's, it, it it looks as daunting as it was that four hundred page book. Yes. Okay, <laughs> now we have to transition. I'm being flagged a little bit to a Q and A. What's we have about fifteen more minutes? Yeah. So we're we're on track for our. You ready to transition and take some questions? I think so. Unless we didn't something talk a little else. bit about the Birmingham work. Oh, uh, yeah. We just, let's just have one okay, minute and cover quickly. that because that's important work. <laughs> I mean, because I think in that work you're seeing deeply in the present, but it's 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 so deep because you're actually seeing into the past as well. I mean, you're really, yeah. you know, breaking that wall of conventional time. Um, so, so if you could talk about that, I I think we would. Well, the Birmingham work. Uh, I'll, I'll try to talk about it briefly. Uh, it goes back to the experience when I was 11 years old and my parents brought home a book uh, of photographs about the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, the book was called The Movement, and it was a book of photographs of and about the Civil Rights Movement uh, with a text written by Lorraine Hansberry that kind of wove these photographers work together, people like Danny Lyon, Charles Moore, photographers who have been actively photographing uh, the Civil Rights Movement. And my folks brought this book home, and there were some horrific photographs yeah. in that book. There were lynching photographs, all the horrors of the Civil Rights Movement, which was like an extended reign of terror mm -hmm. uh, were in that book. And there was one photograph in particular of a young girl, uh, Sarah Jean Collins, uh, laying in a hospital bed with two heavy gauze bandages on her eyes. And she was the surviving sister of one of the four girls who had been killed in the dynamiting of that church. Uh, and I saw that photograph when I was 11 years old, and everything kind of changed for me uh, at that moment. Eventually, I just parked it somewhere in my psyche. Uh, but 30, well, that was when I was 11. In 2005, that image was shaken loose by something. Mm. Uh, and that image of that girl came flashing back, and I knew I needed to go to Birmingham. Mm. I, I knew I needed to make some work about this. Mm. Uh, I didn't know what else to do with that but to make some work about it. And so I started uh, what became seven years of uh, going back and forth to Birmingham, meeting people, doing research, uh, getting to know the community, allowing the community to get to know me, uh, and trying to figure out uh, both materially and conceptually what can I make in response to that horrific history. And ultimately what I decided to do was make photographs of uh, young African-American girls who were the ages that those four girls were who were killed. Mm. Uh, I was trying to grapple with this idea of how does one visualize the past in the contemporary moment. And not just visualize it, but make it resonate. Mm -hmm. 
so I photographed uh, four African American girls, girls who were killed, and I photographed uh, African American women who were the ages that they would have been 50 years later mm. if they had not been killed. And then there were also two boys who were killed that day uh, after the bombing and racist violence that was directly related to the dynamiting of the church. Uh, the boys were 13 and 16, the girls were 11 and 14. And so I, I made portraits of African-American boys in Birmingham who were 13 and 16, and African-American men who were 63 and 66, mm. 50 years, and then put them together uh, in the form of uh, diptychs as a way of visualizing uh, those 50 years. While that seven years of uh, research uh, and engaging with that history uh, has gotten me uh, deeply uh, involved uh, in history yes. and uh, trying to figure out how to visualize some piece of the African-American past in the contemporary moment. Mm -hmm. And I always say not only to visualize, but how to make it resonate, mm -hmm. how to make it resonate uh, in a way that uh, makes the experience palpable yes. uh, for and the viewer. And creates that transformation yeah. that you're talking how, how, about. How to, how how to, to make, make it work it on someone more deeply, how to bring that into the present moment. So the Birmingham was the first uh, work in that history project. And then uh, more recently, there are four pictures uh, on the end of this presentation. Uh, I spent the last two years uh, making photographs uh, in Cleveland and Hudson, Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, and that work is uh, based on the history and the movement uh, of fugitive slaves uh, along the path of what was called the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. uh, in Ohio, trying to uh, reimagine what that experience both looked and felt like mm -hmm. Uh, for those fugitive black bodies moving through that landscape uh, towards freedom. Uh, so I'm, I'm at the moment deeply involved in this, uh, I guess what you could call history project, yes. trying to bring some resonant form to different pieces of uh, African American that historical is, past, it's how so to bring it into a contemporary conversation. Yes. It's so courageous, I think, in so many ways, because looking, you know, you see deeply, and sometimes when you are looking deeply and seeing deeply, it's, it's unbearable. It's so painful. And so, you know, before we open it up, can you just briefly talk about how you do that? How do you live with seeing so deeply? You know, how, how do you, I guess your response is to make the work, you know, but, um, you know, sometimes I think so many of us, we just can't bear to look. You know, but then here you are looking directly at it for years. You know, how, how is that? Well, well I, I think it's about also finding a, a conceptual framework for the work to exist inside mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. because that's what shapes the experience of looking at it. It exists inside of a, a particular narrative, conceptual, historical framework. But then the how of the making, that's just about bringing everything I know about how photographs function formally, optically. I just mean emotionally to... for you. Like emotionally, <laughs> you know, like how do you, you know, but okay, I'm getting. Well, well, <laughs> I, I think if you look at these, okay. the, way, the way the subjects push into our space, uh -huh. that, that's a manipulation of the lens. Without getting too technical, there's this thing called the depth of field. And when you talk about the two-dimensional object, you're always talking about the foreground, back, middle ground, and background, and how you manipulate experience within that space. Uh -huh. So the way I manipulate that experience optically is to push, push them it. into our space almost physically, you know, so that it becomes not just object, but experience. Uh -huh. And I think that's probably the answer to several other questions. Yes. Is to make the work at a level that it, be, that it is an object, but when you engage with it, it becomes experience. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You're, you're aware of both things simultaneously. You know you're looking at a photograph, but you're having an experience yes. that is an actual experience in relation to the thing that the photograph is about. So that's... Perfect. I knew if I kept talking you, long you enough, I'd, I'd find you it. Made it. You made it happen. <laughs> okay, let's open it up for questions. Thank you all. Hello. Hi. 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 Hi.
following up, following up on the personal experience, how has your experience um, coming into third grade to a white school with some racist and, I will add, anti-Semitic teachers, how did that inform your work? Well, that's interesting. This is one of my grade school classmates, by the oh. way. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting next to another Lynn and Ruth, we go back to second, third grade, third grade, actually. Mm. Uh, and Lynn and I, uh, we were among that first group of uh, black kids to be bussed into largely white schools in order to integrate those schools. Uh, and it was a very interesting, in some ways, for me, Twilight Zone-like experience, uh, especially moving from the neighborhood school that I had been in uh, with a second grade teacher whose family I'm still very close to. Mm. It, it was like that. You know, it was a very deep, you know, family, community connection uh, with those teachers and moving into this space that uh, Ruth had described. Uh, I don't know that I have time to, <laughs> really, it was, uh, it, it, it was interesting because it was in some ways very traumatic, but in, in other ways it actually prepares you for a very real aspect of the world out there. You know, after some of the things that I experienced uh, there and other places, it, it's pretty hard to shake me up. Right. You know, because right. uh, <laughs> it, it, just, it just forces you to have uh, a kind of fortitude uh, that hopefully is also supported by, you know, your home environment you know, yes. in a way that uh, makes you realize that the larger world may not always support your sense of who you are, and yet you still have an obligation to your parents, your community, and everything else to so, become this thing yes. that you need to be. But uh, how it impacts the work, I can't say, but how it has impacted me Certainly, because I, I have had those kinds of experiences initially then and in other places where people don't see you as who you are. They see you as the person that they imagine you to be based on their limited set of uh, experiences. You know, probably the most profound thing that would happen to me in grade school, uh, I, I grew up in a house with a lot of books. My dad had a library full of books. We had the World Book Encyclopedia. We had the World Book of American Poetry. I don't think my teachers knew that. Right. Probably had more books in my house than they did. Right. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Yeah. So whenever I got an assignment to write something, I would bring in a pretty good piece of work. <laughs> you know, write a poem. That ain't no challenge to me. Write a poem. Right. I got a whole library full of poems. I know how to write a poem. I know right. how to write a poem. But I would bring that poem in and put it on that white teacher's desk. And she would say, where did you copy that from? Right. And that's not an uncommon experience. I mean, I'm sure you can tell stories too. Where, where did you copy that from? Right. But to me, it was quite bizarre. Of all the things I needed to copy, a poem was not, was not one, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Seriously, right, <laughs> no. maybe some uh, chemistry equation. And interestingly enough, it didn't stop me from writing poetry. There's a whole piece of my life when I was publishing in literary journals, huh. because that, that was their problem. It wasn't my problem. Mm -hmm. it, it was never going to become my problem. Mm -hmm. Good. Dawood, I'm Sandra Handloser. I've been chasing you on the Facebook for months. I. Um, I have a couple of things that are of interest to me because uh, not only do I know your work from a long time ago, um, I worked as a, a stylist for photographers and I had to consider what wardrobe a, a subject would wear and how it would mm look against a background or s make suggestions to a photographer or the photographer would say to me let's bring in 20 outfits and choose what you know as as you have managed to 
you have managed to make iconic images that feel fresh and not rigid. So there's a delicate balance right. there that you've achieved. These people live in the clothes they're wearing. However, what kind of control or influence would you exercise over your subjects when you were composing your pictures? Did you tell them to bring in a few outfits and you would choose the one that you liked on them or their favorite outfit? And what about their accessories, their watches and rings and so forth? I'm just interested in, since they all seem so Okay, well, it's, it's, interesting it's an interesting like, question uh -huh. because uh, especially in relation to the portrait, I'm, I'm authoring the experience of this individual with their participation. Uh, the one thing I'm acutely aware of when I was making work with the human subject uh, I'm the only one who knows what the person looks like at any given moment. Uh, most of us don't know what we look like right now. Right. Yeah, we don't. We don't. Uh, and for me, that those uh, the way in which the uh, the way in which the interior makes itself visible on the surface of the face at any given moment was the thing that I'm acutely aware of. So if there was any uh, degree of control, that control had to do, one, first of all, and most fundamentally, with shaping the body mm -hmm. to the frame, to the space that I had to work with, the, the immovable rectangular space that I have to make my work within, which means if the photograph is vertical and the arms are out here and being cut off, I have to do something, you know, to reshape the body in relation to. And my experience, my, my directions to people were never explicit because in order for the portrait to resonate, the behavior, the gestural behavior had to be theirs. I can make suggestions to them, and they'll respond. But <clears throat> I could never say, do this. Right. Put your hand there. Because then it would look very uh, stiff and unbelievable. So it was, you know, these photographs, the Polaroid portraits, and all the portraits that I've made since, uh, about a kind of even-handed directing of the person in front of the camera in such a way as to not uh, disturb the psychology that is at the root of what makes them engaging at that level. So the way I work is very quiet. It's a very contemplative space. Yeah. I don't give a lot of instructions. Uh, and I, it, it's a more complicated process than I can explain quickly. Yeah. But the gestural behavior always has to come from the subject. And then what I do is to shape that behavior to the shape of the picture. That's not precisely my question. My question was, I, that's sort of evident. That's not what I was I feel that you to? told me to come as I was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it yeah. was very... Generally, yeah, generally, generally yeah. speaking, generally speaking, I will tell people, wear whatever you want, just don't wear a white shirt. Right. That's what I was because the right. white shirt is a technical problem. Right. Yeah, it, it's a technical problem. Right. The exposure for a white shirt and any color skin, it's a technical it's problem. Technical. But I remember That's almost being... impossible to resolve. So generally speaking, I want people to feel comfortable. In order for them to feel comfortable, I just tell them, wear whatever you want. Just don't wear a white shirt. Right. <laughs> I, I felt that it was very choreographic. Like you, I, I remember you sort of energetically moving me into a... What did you, in, what, well, since you were I'm once a subject, this. what do you remember about the experience? Well, I remember it being deeply um, meditative and quiet. I, I do remember it being very still. And I remember you moving around or, or with your eyes, actually, looking at me, considering different things, keeping a lot of eye contact, and just sort of 
making slight movements that made me follow them. And, and, and yet it felt very organic. I felt like I was falling into a position that was my own. And yet I was following an unspoken lead yeah. that, you were, that you were giving me, you know? Yeah, yeah, and when I look at this now, it's very true to me. And yet I don't think I would have just naturally arrived there had you not energetically mm -hmm. moved me there. <laughs> yeah, you sometimes know? I'll perform what I want the person to do. Right. Like, why don't you just look and I'll be kind of doing it, yeah. you know, just to help them with the gesture. Or I'll just say, you know, do something else with your hands. You know, try something else with your... And I'm doing all kinds of things. Right. Not saying do what I do. Right. Because they can't do what I do. Like, I could never tell you to do that. Right. Yeah. You know, right. I could never... It would never right. occur to me to say, put your hand under your chin, keep one finger here, <laughs> but put two... I can't imagine that stuff. So you have to give people the space to perform their own behavior. Because the most interesting things, uh, and, and, and this was something that I remember uh, my favorite uh, professor from grad school saying, Richard Benson. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Benson said, Dao, the things that are going on in the world are so much more interesting than anything you can make up. Mm. <laughs> and it's true. Yeah. It's true. I could never make that up. But right. I, and I just need to kind of stay out of the way so that the person is able to perform themselves. Right. Because the most interesting thing that they're going to do is not something I can make up. Mm. I just have to let it happen. Mm. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to that next generation you were talking about is so different than your generation in terms of communities. And maybe one piece of advice you have for that generation in their career trajectory. What advice I have for that generation? That's a perfect question well, to end on. It's going to be our last question. So okay. You, the next generation. Mm -hmm. Well, I th to me, the most important thing would be to make work that matters. Bring something into the world that has consequence. That doesn't dictate the form. It doesn't dictate the material. But just make work that you believe matters, that has the capacity to transform the world in some kind of way. And ideally, to transform the world in a way that leaves the viewer and by extension, the larger community uh, in a better place than they were before they encountered your work. Uh, but beyond that, it's just make work that matters, that comes, that comes from a real place of conviction. Mm -hmm. And then learn everything you need to know about how to give that some meaningful and resonant form. Because a sloppy object that's well-intentioned is pretty much a meaningless object to me. And intention doesn't carry the day. So it has to come from a place of deep conviction, but it also has to be steeped enough uh, in the histories of whatever form you are working in, whatever idiom, whatever material, to know enough about how to manipulate those materials to make that object really work on the viewer so that the thing that you care about becomes something that they begin to care about. But that happens through the quality of the objects that we make. It doesn't happen because you have a good heart. I'm sorry. I mean, a, a good heart is a good place to start, but you have to be able to make that into something that holds its own and holds that conversation when you're not there to say, hey, I have a good heart. I'm a good person. Don't you know that? No, all we know is what you made. And the work has to carry that intention out into the world for you. Yes. Thank you so much, Dalian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, speak very loudly. I just want to once again thank uh, Rebecca and Dawood for such an enlightening conversation. And please. Uh, join us outside where, uh, to, if you want to buy a copy of the book, and Dawood will be signing them. Thank you so much.